that his son, Jesus Christ, would be on the throne in Jerusalem, in millennium, and he would reign over the world for a thousand years. That is determined by the Lord. But Antichrist, I'm, I'm, I can give you verses and references for all of this, but it's a whole study in our Bible Institute, and it's very difficult to boil down into an hour study in pastor's class. So I'm not going to read, go to, and read all of the references. But Satan, in chapter 14 of Isaiah, he said, I will ascend. I will be above the Lord. I, 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 I. Five times he said that in chapter 14 of Isaiah. So he desires to overthrow the Lord and reign in place of the Lord. That's, that's the goal of Satan since he was, since he uh, perverted himself in heaven. And that's the goal of Satan today. He said in Isaiah 14, I will ascend above, I will sit on the seat above God. Now, consider, he hasn't done it yet. Sure, that happened before the creation of the world. The war between God and Satan. Yes, uh, that was probably took place between Genesis 1-1 one, one and Genesis 1-2, that period right there. Yeah. When God created everything, He always creates everything perfect. And in Genesis 1-2, it says <coughs> the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. It's called the... Uh, the what? The expanse. Uh, gap theory. But I believe it personally. You don't have to in order to be my friend. But something happened between God's original creation and when in Genesis 1-3 he said, let there be light. Something happened in between there. There was very much uh, war between the prince of the powers of the air between us and the Lord. And he ruined everything, which he always does. He ruined everything that God tried to establish. And that's true personally in our lives, with our families, with our ministries. He is our enemy and he is trying to destroy everything that we are connected with the Lord. But in tribulation, Antichrist, is in the beginning of a Very simple time map. Here we are, right here, September 20, 2022, and right there is the rapture. It's going to happen this afternoon. Okay? Be prepared. You ought to practice. <laughs> practice, because you're going up if you're saved. Now, when we go up in the rapture, sometime after that is the tribulation. It lasts seven years. It's a time of testing for the nation of Israel, and yet the whole world 
is involved in it. It's also called Jacob's Trouble because it's for the Jews. You will not be here. If your wife and family are saved, they will not be here. But the Jews will be here. Now, the thing that we're studying right now is Absalom. And look in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 3. Now watch it. Absalom is a type of the Antichrist in tribulation. Watch it. Verse 4, Absalom said moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, to worship and honor him. That's what obeisance means. He put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Hmm. Look at all these similarities to one person. Judas. Interesting. You remember when Jesus was in the garden and Judas had betrayed him and he came and the thing that he used to identify the person that was Christ to the soldiers, because there were others in the garden, he used the kiss to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And the soldiers, when he saw, when they saw that he kissed Christ, that was the signal for them to arrest Jesus Christ. Verse 6, 2 Samuel 15. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to him for judgment. So Absalom <whistles> stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Last week, last couple weeks, we've studied this and we asked the question. Can anything, can anybody steal your heart? Mm -hmm. Is it available to be stolen? Now, the phone is here. Mm -hmm. Somebody could steal that phone. Mm -hmm. So I take it and I put it in my yes. front pocket. It is unlikely, it can still happen, but it's unlikely that anyone will steal my telephone. This bag is open to yes. be stolen. But if I put it close to me or if I clutch it yes. like this, God, it's unlikely that anybody is going to steal yes. my bag. The same way, can your heart be stolen? And can it be stolen by a woman? Mm. Many stories in the Bible. Story. Can it be stolen by a child? One of your children? That's what happened to David. Can it be stolen by an object? A brand new red Porsche sports car? Mm. Or a motorcycle? Or a television set? Or a new home? Can your heart be taken away from God and stolen? They, 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 the people of Israel that claimed they believed in Jehovah God, when this man Absalom came and used politics on them and kissed them and kissed their babies and said, vote for me to be judge. And the Bible says Absalom was a very handsome man, mm -hmm. a very likable man. These are all types of antichrist. We'll see this yes. in just a minute. When the antichrist comes, he doesn't have horns on his head and a tail with a fork at the end of it. That's not how antichrist comes. He comes, well, we'll study that in just a minute. 
But let's read verse 6 again. Chapter 15, verse 6. And on this manner did Absalom, that's David's son, that was a murderer, he killed his brother Amnon. This is David's son <coughs> is stealing the throne. He's rebelling against his father's wishes. He's against the king, the ruler. He's against the law. And he is running for high office. He wants to be king, ultimately. He says in verse 6, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now, in the first half of tribulation, <clears throat> In this part, this part of it, the last three and a half years is called Great Tribulation. The whole thing is called Tribulation. The last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. What makes the difference? The difference is Absalom is a type of Antichrist and the first three and a half years Antichrist is the answer for the people of the world. He is a deceiver. He is a murderer according to Absalom. Here. But look, if you will, in Revelation chapter 19, uh, 13, 13 and verse 3. Revelation 13, 3. This is the middle of tribulation. Revelation 13, 3. I want you to see it. Revelation 13, 3. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it had as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world worshipped after the beast. Well, you'd have to read quite a bit in order to get the context, but take me either read all of that, study yourself, or take it from my word. The beast and the antichrist are the same. And the Bible tells us that all, look at that, all, look at that, all the world worshipped after the beast. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine there's troubles in the world today? Yes. There's potential war with China. There's trouble with Taiwan. The United States is experiencing inflation. Russia has invaded Ukraine. They're threatening to use nuclear weapons. Uh, there are people that are experiencing a famine. There's great uh, fires in California. Yesterday there was a major earthquake in Mexico City. And all the world, Philippines has their troubles too. All the world has big, big troubles. Okay. Can you imagine if a man stepped onto the world scene, regardless of where he is or what he is, he becomes famous through the news media and uh, uh, cell phones and uh, Facebook and all of that. And suddenly everybody is talking about this man, <coughs> this person. Women are talking about how handsome he is. Now, we don't care about how handsome he is, but he solved <coughs> the problem between the war of, between China and Taiwan. He solved the problem. He made peace. 
between China and <coughs> Taiwan. That's impossible. Uh, you can't, that's been going on since before the end of World War II. I can give you the history of it, but Taiwan claimed independence from China. They're like that close. But Taiwan said, no, we don't want to be part of China. We want to be on our own. China said, no, you're ours. This fighting between the two has been going on for 75 years. This man steps on the scene and somehow he talks to the leaders of China. And he, I'm making this up now. But he talks then to the leaders of Taiwan and he makes peace between Taiwan and China. Now, in the Middle East, you've got Israel and you've got Iran. And Iran is right today, right now, Iran is trying their best, pouring billions of dollars into making a nuclear missile for one purpose, to send to Israel, to wipe Israel off the map so that Israel, the land, would then be inhabited by Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians. Jerusalem would be no more the capital of Israel. It would be Palestine, it wouldn't be Israel. And where are the Jews? Well, their enemies, Iran said, who cares? Who cares? They would love to accomplish that. Well, that's been happening since 1948, since Israel became a nation, mm -hmm. and nobody, 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 nobody has been successful in bringing peace between Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and Israel. It can't, it can't happen. Many United States presidents and other heads of state around the world have tried to make peace between Israel and its enemies. It can't happen. Suppose this man, good-looking man, steps onto the scene of the world and he goes to Israel and does magic and makes peace between Israel and Iran and her neighbors. Iran lays down their weapons and promises they're not going to attack Israel anymore. Okay, now, those are two major things, yes. problems in the world that this man has solved. And you can't deny that he is to be credited with the peace between China and Taiwan between Israel and Iran, you you would or yeah Iran, you would be willing to yeah. say, well, it happened because of this man. Yes. I'm not giving him a name yes. yet. Then the economy. There's inflation. There's problems. There's you don't. Uh, I mean, the Philippines feels left out as far as the world economy is concerned. Well, this man steps on the scene and somehow he makes everything okay and acceptable in the world as far as economy is concerned. That, that can't happen. That's a miracle. This man does it. You know what you and I would be tempted to do is to vote for this man if there was an election for king of the world yes. or president of the world, you would be persuaded easily to vote for this person. Now, as a Bible believer, I would cast my eye and I would say, wow, look what he's doing. Is this the answer to the prophecy of the Antichrist? I don't know. I'm Is he certainly not going to give him my vote. That's exactly what happened with Absalom. Also go to Revelation 14 and verse 9. Revelation 14, 9. And when you read this, think of 
the Antichrist, but think of Absalom. Look, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, Antichrist, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, that's what's going to happen. It's going to happen with Antichrist in tribulation. You, if you're a Christian, don't have to worry about it. But it is going to happen. We'll be gone. We'll be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. But Antichrist is going to be worshipped because he seemingly has the answer. Well, Absalom right here, he said, oh, that I were made judge. He said, every man's cause is good, but the king is too busy to answer your cause. So if you would make me king, I would pass correct judgment and your cause, the reason why you need judgment, would be solved. So the whole world, we're gone. The whole world votes for Antichrist. <laughs> now, Antichrist, go, go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Jeremiah 11 teaches Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, and look in verse 23. And when you read this, think about Antichrist, but think about Absalom. Verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after him, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. There's Antichrist as he becomes popular in the earth. Look in verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Okay, here's somebody that is a good speaker. He gets on international broadcasts, CNN News, um, even whatever your major news corporation, whatever you watch for your news, this man comes on and whatever he says sounds good. It sounds like the answer. You, if you don't know history, then trust me, I read a hundred books on Hitler, and Hitler was a great orator, speaker. If he had been a gospel preacher, God would have used him, but he wasn't, so the devil used him. And uh, in, on Sunday morning, I showed you on the screen a picture of Hitler and the way he talked. If, if he were in my class of how to preach, and I do teach that class, if he were in that, I would give him an A, A plus. I would give him 100. You did a very good job. So when Antichrist speaks, he speaks with authority. He never makes a mistake. He never has to say, oh, what I meant was, and go that way. He never made a perfect speech. And Antichrist is that way. And look at him in verse 25. And he shall speak great words. Look against the Most High. Who's the Most High? That's the Lord. Okay. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. You know what they're doing in the United States? They're trying to take the Constitution and rip it up. Yeah. We don't need any more 
laws. They're trying to put the police out of operation. Big communities are saying, defund the police, throw them out. We don't need the police. We don't need the Constitution. We do not need the FBI. We do not need the CIA. We do not need the, the Attorney General. They don't want laws anymore. They, the Supreme Court just passed a law, and all they said was on abortion, all the Supreme Court said was that this decision <clears throat> to make abortion legal or illegal should be go back to the states instead of the federal government. The states, individual states, should make a law, whether they think they should have abortion or whether they think it's against the law. That's all they said. And everybody is upset about it. And they say, no, no. The women are saying, we have a right to our own bodies, and we can do what we want, and we don't want the Supreme Court and the Constitution of the United States. Throw them out. I was raised in the United States. The Supreme Court is the Supreme Court. You don't throw out the Constitution. It just, it's like, Pulling the foundation out from this building, what would happen? It would collapse. <coughs> Antichrist steps on the scene of the world and the people saying, we don't want this law. We want to change. So he says, okay, we'll change it. You want abortion? You can have abortion. You want to be able to steal, murder, and rape, pillage, and all that? Okay, we'll pass that law. So he is received by the people and even worshipped by the people. Look in verse 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. That's Antichrist. Now, one more place, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is about tribulation and about Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, see. What I said at the beginning is that when you become a mature Bible student, you will progress to where you can see types in the Bible. Uh, Saul is a type of the flesh. Amalek is a type of the flesh. It doesn't mean that the stories in the Bible are not true or that you can spiritually uh, make them not real. That doesn't mean that. It means that you're going from the historical fact to something in the future that that applies to. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Is it warm in here? Does it seem warm in here? It does? It's okay. Yeah. Everybody's going to sleep on me. I don't know what's the matter. Is that working? Is it not working? Does anybody know anything about air conditioning? Great. Okay. Just leave it the way it is. I'm sitting here in an air conditioned room, small, and I'm sweating. Man. Okay, chapter 2. And look in verse 5. This is when Antichrist shows up and becomes a great man, the first half of tribulation. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that uh, what withholdeth that he, Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he 
who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Now what 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 what, what what's going on? Antichrist in the first half of tribulation, nobody knows that he's the devil incarnate. Nobody knows that he's going to try to overthrow uh, God's people and God's Messiah and God's King. And nobody knows that. They think he is yes. the best thing that ever happened to the world. And they'll vote for him because he solved the problem between China and Taiwan, because he solved the problem between Israel and the Muslims, and he's just a great man. Mm -hmm. Then, in the middle of tribulation, and we'll get to it in just a minute, Antichrist is revealed. <laughs> now, Absalom, when he first comes on the scene, he steals the hearts of the people of is the men of Israel. They think he's great. They think he's greater than David. <laughs> yes. And then he is revealed. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what Absalom is up to. He wants to kill the king and reign himself. Nobody knows what Antichrist wants to do. But then he is revealed. Read on and then I'll come and explain it. And then shall, verse 8, then shall that wicked, notice capital W, that is wicked. That is the name, one of the names of Antichrist. You don't use a capital unless you're uh, using a personal name. If you wrote about this pastor school, you would say pastor school is great and the teacher is Gerald Sutek and you would write capital G E R A L D you'd use the capital so when we're talking about Antichrist he says he's called wicked is one of his names would that be terrible if one of your names was wicked all right verse chapter 2 and verse 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed second time whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him antichrist whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. These are the people in this time that would not receive a gospel track, that would not go to the altar and repent and be saved, that sit in church and go through all the ritual and motions of being a Christian, and yet they're never, they never were saved and time passes and the rapture happens and they're left. We go, they're left. And they begin to go through tribulation and they think Antichrist is the best thing since sliced bread and they vote for him and they take his mark so that they can function in his world. That's what it says. And God then shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they, verse 11, might be damned, verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not <coughs> but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this is what happens. In the middle of tribulation, up to this point, Antichrist is great. He does miracles. He brings peace, or what seems to be peace. And everybody worships Antichrist until in the middle of the week he 
And in the beginning here, even the Jews, even Israel, believe Antichrist is Messiah. You remember when Jesus came, the Jews said, crucify him, crucify him. This, this man will not be king, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. You remember all those things that happened when Jesus came? They rejected the person of God in Jesus Christ. Well, when Antichrist comes, the Jews accept him as Messiah. They rejected God and they accept Satan. That's exactly what happens. Antichrist makes a promise to them. He makes a covenant with them. He promises. He said, I'll keep peace between you and the Muslims. I'll even I'll even build you a temple. I'll even make it possible to build this temple on Mount Zion. Right there, the Temple Mount. I've been there. The Mosque of Omar is right here. On the Temple Mount is the um, um, we call that place Great Dome of the Rock, which is the third holiest place for the Muslims. Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. And the Muslims right now, they don't own Jerusalem. They don't own Israel, but they can use that for a mosque and they can go to the Dome of the Rock. That's a very holy place in Islam. And if the Jews ever decided to try to build the temple, destroy the Dome of the Rock, there would be all-out jihad war between Israel and uh, the in uh, Iraq and Palestine, and they would, if you would never, you couldn't believe the massacre that would take place. But when Antichrist comes, right now, it's absolutely impossible for Israel to build a temple on. The Temple Mount, right there, Mount Zion. I've stood right there and looked inside the Dome of the Rock. And right there is where the temple is going to be built. Now, Antichrist comes on the scene and he says to the Jews, I'll even build you a temple and I'll build you a temple right there where the Jews say it has to be built or it's not really the legitimate temple. And Antichrist will go to work, make a covenant, and begin building that temple. Now, when I went there, they have a place called the Temple Institute, mm -hmm. which is Jewish, belongs to Israel. And they say, I went there. They say that everything is already prefabricated, made, already made to build the temple. Yes. That's how close we are. They claim they won't show you because the Arabs would drop a bomb on it. But they claim that they even had the stones cut. <laughs> Prefab stones for the temple. They have all the furniture in the temple, like Solomon's temple, like the tabernacle. And they have, uh, they claim they have the Ark of the Covenant, but they can't have that. But I saw, personally, I saw the candlestick for the temple that they've already built. It was like 15 feet high and the, a giant candelabra, which is kind of a uh, symbol for Israel.
You've seen that symbol for Israel. That's the candlestick that was in the Temple of Solomon. And they, they light these and they do their celebrations. Very holy candlestick. I've seen it. The one that's going to be in the temple that Antichrist is going to build after he makes a covenant with the Jews is already made. Uh -huh. We're that close. We are right here before the rapture. It's exciting. Amen. Menorah. 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 Same thing. Okay. Now, in the middle of tribulation, Antichrist has been worshipped by the world. The Jews have made a covenant with him like they should have made with the Lord, but they rejected the Lord. And right in the middle of the week, three and a half years into tribulation, Antichrist breaks that covenant with the Jews. The temple is to some, to some degree finished. And Antichrist, if you know anything, we've studied it in great depth here in pastor's class and of course in our institute. But the temple is there and you go into the holy place and there's a veil that separates the most holy place from the holy place. The Ark of the Covenant is in there. Yes. Will be in there. The real Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. But the one that the Temple Institute will build will be there. That's supposed to be the most holy place in the world. Because when everything is operating correctly, then God's presence <clears throat> occupies the, the uh, top of the Ark of the Covenant. The, um, uh, my brain's not functioning. Right there is a picture of it. It's all, I mean, it's, it, right there is a type. The um, two uh, cherub here. What do you call that? What do you call that? Top the lid of the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubims. <laughs> My brain is not working. <laughs> Nobody knows? Yes, sir. What? I can't believe I can't believe. come up with this. Um, uh, anyway, right there between the cherubims. If everything is in order, God's presence is there. But of course, this is the temple of Antichrist, and the Jews don't care, and Antichrist takes over, and he takes the curtains, and pulls them <coughs> apart, and he goes in and sits down on that thing that I can't think of the name of. The Ark of the Covenant, Mercy seat. Why couldn't you help me? Mercy seat. And Antichrist sits down between the cherubims and claims he is God, the creator of heaven and earth. And if you disagree, you're killed. You remember in Daniel chapter 3 and the music played and everybody bowed down to the statue and the three Hebrew children would not bow down? Yes. And they were, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, you go into the fiery furnace. Yes. And they went in and were miraculously saved from that. And, 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 yeah. and Nebuchadnezzar is a type of... of Antichrist, and he said, You're going to be killed, and that same thing will take place when Antichrist sits on the mercy seat and claims, I am God. Then Antichrist initiates, he puts into place the mark of the beast, which is a mark burnt onto like a like a cattle um, 
Sieben. Sieben. In verse 5, a new word for you that are still kind of English as your second language and you're still learning new words. Look in Colossians 3 5. Yes, Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth. Fornication, uncleanness, look at it. Inordinate affections, evil communication, evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry look at that 
inordinate affection. Probably if I forced you, gave you a piece of paper, and asked you to write a definition of inordinate affection, probably most of you would have a real problem coming up with the definition. Inordinate. Here it is from the dictionary. He might, he might, but 
He still didn't do right. He did wrong in loving Absalom too much. And Nathan was not referring anything about Absalom when he preached to David. He wasn't referring to him. He said, your child that Bathsheba is about to deliver, he is going to die. But he didn't make any reference to Absalom that I know of. Okay, now, David, we're studying the stupidity of kings, and David made a bad decision, a stupid decision, based upon his love for Absalom. Okay, we are kings, according to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. We are kings. Don't make that stupid decision. To love your spouse, to love your wife, love your children, to love material things, to love your business, to love money, to love anything more than you love God. And how can you ever know that? Because if God says one thing and your wife doesn't want to go along with it, if you follow your wife or your children, or that person or thing that you love, and you do not do what God says to do. You know you have arrived at the place where you have important affection. You love your wife, you love your sister, you love your mother more than you love God. I remember when I was in Bible college, there was one of our students in my class, he was a Mexican. He was raised Catholic. He was raised on the border of Mexico and Texas. His mother was what you would call a devout Catholic. And he got saved out of Catholicism. He was a grown man. He was 20 years old. And he got saved. And he came home and told his mother. And his mother just went crazy. She couldn't believe that he would leave Mother Church, the Catholic Church, and go to a Baptist church. You're crazy. And she cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. Then the Lord talked to that young man about preaching and going to Bible college. And that young man was ready to leave to go to Bible college. He hadn't told his mother yet. And his mother's already upset with him because he's saved and going to a Baptist church. And then he decides to go to Bible college and become a preacher. And his mother, I'll never forget this story. His mother, his mother, you understand, got on her knees and got her hands around the bottom part of his leg and death grip. She wouldn't let go. And she's crying. Oh, no! Can you imagine your mother? And he says, Mother, Mom, I have to go. God's called me. No, you can be a priest. You can, you can worship in the Catholic Church. Worship Mary. Worship this one. She's got a death grip on the bottom of his legs and she's crying. And he told this testimony. He said it came time for him to go and he had to reach down and break that grip and take his legs out and leave with his mother saying, oh no, please don't go. And he left and went to Bible college. Now he was right and David was wrong yes. because David loved Absalom more than he loved God and that's what if, if, if the devil can get you into that position to where God could tell you something through his word or say something through the Bible and your wife or your children or your mother or your aunt or 
your grandma doesn't believe that. So are you really a Bible believer? Are you going to believe that book? Now, years and years and years and years and years ago, I got saved in 1963. But just a short time after that, I made the life-changing decision that that book was going to be my authority. That Bible is God's perfect word of God Amen. and whatever that book says I will believe it and I will obey it Amen. and I've never been sorry for that Amen. I'm not saying I've always <clears throat> obeyed it exactly the way he revealed it to me I'm, I've sinned since I've been saved but that didn't change the fact that that book is right and my wife is wrong if she disagrees with it my children are wrong if they disagree with it. Yes. And I live that way today. Let me tell you something. I determined that 50 plus years ago. If I went home this afternoon and my wife said, I no longer want to be a part of this ministry. I no longer want to serve God. I would say, bye bye. Uh, yeah. bye, -bye. I'm staying here. I'm with the Lord. And it has been the stability of my life for over 50 years. Amen. Now, I've, I've gone from teaching to preaching. I know that. Which I often do. Now, David made the wrong decision. He made a stupid decision. Don't you make that same decision. Now, Here's what happened. Absalom had a parade. Fifty men to run before him. Instruments playing. Telling the people that Absalom is king. And David did nothing about it. And uh, Absalom then leads, or excuse me, he puts so much pressure on David that David leaves. David leaves Jerusalem. He is the king. And you want to just take David and grab him by his shirts and say, David, 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 wake up, wake up. Don't make this stupid mistake. And David makes it. He leaves Jerusalem. And he turns over the kingdom to Absalom. Now, David is a picture, really, of Israel in the middle of tribulation. They made this covenant with Antichrist. He built them a temple, which is not of God. It's of the devil. And in the middle of it, the devil reveals himself in Antichrist and says, I am God, and you worship me now. You want to take Israel by the shirt and say, no, 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 don't do that. Christ is your Messiah. So they, make, they make the wrong choice again. And yes. they are punished. And that's what tribulation basically is all about. Yes. To try yes. to get those that worship Antichrist separated yes. from those yes. that want to get right and be with God. And those that want to get right and be with God are the um, remnant, those left over. And they are taken out of tribulation and they are called to go out into the wilderness to be with Christ. And Christ reveals himself to them there in Sela Petra and they accept him as Messiah. But the majority of Israel stays there and worships the devil. Amen. Hmm. Wow. Now, David flees and he goes out into the wilderness and uh, people follow him that are for David and on his side and he stays in the wilderness and look at verse chapter 16 and verse 21, chapter 16, 
at verse 21. Here's Absalom in Jerusalem taking over the kingdom. And it says, Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. Now, Ahithophel was David's faithful counselor all the time he was king. But Ahithophel now falls away from David and joins with Absalom. Why? Ahithophel, who is he? He is Bathsheba's grandfather. And Ahithophel was a counselor in David's kingdom when David made the decision with Bathsheba. So Ahithophel is not on David's side. He joins Absalom. But God or David prays that Ahithophel will give bad counsel. And he ends up doing exactly that. Now David goes in chapter 17, chapter 17 of 2 Samuel. It's interesting, just interesting. 1 Samuel 17 is when David defeated Goliath. 2 Samuel 17 is when David is defeated by Absalom. Interesting. Verse 15. Chapter 17, verse 15. Then said Hushai unto Zedek and to, the, uh, to Abiathar the priest, Thus and thus did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and thus have I counsel. Now therefore sin quickly and tell David, saying, Lodge not this night in the plains of the wilderness. Look back, keep your finger there, and look back in chapter 15 and verse 28. 15, 28. David says, before he leaves it, uh, Jerusalem, he says, see, verse 28, see, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. So David, the great man of war, decides he's going to stay outside in the open air, in the plain. Uh, in just the open ground. And there's no, he's not in a cave. He's not in a ditch. He's not in a hidden valley. He's not hiding. He's staying in wide open. And that's exactly where uh, Ahithophel told Absalom, that's what, where you should go and get David. And so the messenger sends to David and says, don't stay in the plain go somewhere else. And so David and his people are saved because of that messenger. And David makes the decision then to get out of the plains and go somewhere else. Now, look at the inordinate affection toward Absalom. In chapter 18, chapter 18 and Verse 4. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. Verse 5. And the king commanded, watch it. The king, now this, uh, excuse me, we're about over, but let me review one minute. You remember, Absalom is a murderer. So is Antichrist. Absalom is a rebel against the government. So is Antichrist. Absalom uh, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So does Antichrist. And here, so that's 
more than one capital crime that he should have been put to death for. And look what David says in verse 5. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently, what? Deal gently with, for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. David, 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 he says, be kind, be nice to Absalom. <laughs> He deserved to die twice. And the king saying, now, you, you treat him kind. You be, be soft with Absalom. That's inordinate affection. He loved Absalom too much. Don't do that with anybody in your household or your relatives. Verse 6, so the people went out into the field against Israel. The battle was in the wood of Israel battle of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. So many people died because David made a bad judgment that was stupid. How would you, what if, what if your uncle was one of David's men and David the king made this decision to flee and because David made a stupid decision, your uncle got killed. An innocent man. How would you feel about that? You would be mad at the king. And people were. Verse 8, for the battle was there scattered over all the face of the country, and the wood devoured more people that, that day than the sword devoured. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the earth, the heaven and earth, and the mule that was under him went away. Now, every picture of someone who illustrates the Bible. If they draw a picture of this scene, every picture shows Absalom, his hair got caught in the branches of the tree. Because Absalom did have long hair. And Absalom is suspended. His mule went out from him and he's hanging from the tree by his hair. The Bible doesn't say hair. It says head. Mm -hmm. Somehow, you know, Absalom was riding, not paying attention, and he went into maybe uh, something like this in the tree, and his head got caught, and he's hanged in the tree. And then Joab sees him and puts spears in him, and kills him. But isn't it, isn't it something? Antichrist. <laughs> Judas Iscariot. <laughs> Nobody knew that Judas was the devil. Jesus said, I've appointed you twelve. I've chosen you twelve. And one of you is a devil. That's Judas Iscariot. Absalom Nobody knew that Absalom was what he was until he was revealed. Not even the 12 apostles knew that Judas was a devil. When Jesus, at the Last Supper, when Jesus gave the bread and, and the, the uh, grape juice, and he said, there's one of you that's going to betray me. There's only 12 people at the table and Jesus. And Jesus gave the bread and the new wine. And he said, one of you will betray me. Before, earlier, he said, one of you is a devil. Now, he said, one of you will betray me. And John and another disciple got to talking. And they said, who is 
Jesus Lord, they didn't know that Jesus was the betrayer and a devil. They didn't know it until it was revealed to them. Absalom, nobody knew that he was going to overthrow and try to kill the king. The Antichrist, the first half of tribulation, nobody knows the Antichrist is the devil in the flesh until he's revealed. In the middle of tribulation, the Bible says the devil, the devil in the sky is cast down to the earth because he knows he hath but a short time. In the middle of tribulation is when the devil comes into Antichrist and he becomes the devil in the flesh. When he is revealed, he sits on the mercy seat and he says, I am God. So you got Absalom, you got Judas, and you've got the Antichrist all tight together. And what can you learn from that? You study Absalom, you're studying Antichrist. You study Judas Iscariot, you're studying the Antichrist. So from those two types, we can see what's going to take place in the future. Not from a crystal ball. Not from a woman that hath a familiar spirit. <clears throat> but from the Word of God. Yes. And that is tremendous value upon the Word of God. Amen. There's no Amen. book like it. There's no book like it. I'm highly recommending that you read it and your lunch is going to be served Amen. in just a moment. Any question? Any debate? Yes? Who the disciples are not paying attention to Jesus? The time when he said, One of you will betray me. Were the disciples not paying attention? To yes, him? because they said, Who is it, Lord? Yeah. And you remember, John was leaning on the breast of Jesus, and all the disciples were saying, John, 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 ask me who that is. And, G and John said, Who is it, Lord? And I forget Jesus' response at that moment, but shortly after that, the devil, oh, he, Jesus said, I give you a piece of bread. The next person I give the bread to is the person he gave it to Judas. And the men, the, 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 the disciples had just spent three and a half years living side by side with Judas. And they didn't know he was a devil. And when Jesus gave him that piece bread. The men looked around and they said, Jews? Wow. And Jesus said to Judas, what thou doest, do quickly. Because it's moving on now. And the, the apostles were amazed that it was Jesus. The devil is that deceptive. Antichrist is that deceiving that even you wouldn't be able to pick him out. Of course, we're gone. Praise God that we're gone. Any other questions? Any debate? All right, Lord, please bless this uh, teaching, this truth from the Word of God. And I pray you bless the meal and bless the activities going on in Claveria right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.